Uh, this is reuse. Uh, this is presentation at uh, Go to Aarhus uh, a couple of weeks ago. Um, but some of the stuff here will be useful to you, uh, maybe in a different setting and uh, a different mindset than the ones that were at, at Go to Aarhus. Because um, being at Go to Aarhus as an Erlang developer or an Erlanger was quite thing. Over here on, on the left hand side, you have your yeah, this doesn't work really well on this one. You'd have your average Java person go to what used to be called Jao, which was something with J or something with uh, Java. And uh, they don't understand these other things. It's just what the. So, so the typical conversation at the booth uh, was uh, how will you beat me? And you say, well, I have this cool technology. And you say, ah, oh, it doesn't do inheritance. Uh, no, but, and no, no, I'll crush and kill you. And then they left the booth. So that's <laughs> how it was to be there. It was Java land uh, very much. But uh, anyway, so uh, we went on, and then we have this flashy uh, front side board. And um, I'm on, tw on Twitter, where I'll do random peeps and beeps as, as everybody else. And then I had my uh, blog, Musics, Musings of an Erling Priest. It's not, but I don't write that often, but every now I get a fit about something and then something has to come out. There's a reason why, uh, there's a story about why I love Erlang. There's a reason why I don't trust a benchmark that I haven't rigged myself uh, there. So that, that's something to, to enjoy. There'll be more coming when, yeah. So today I'll talk about Erlang fundamentals. And for those of you already familiar with Erlang, this will be a recap. But it's also something you can use if you're into an argument with people and they need to understand what this weird thing is doing. Then some of these will be, feel free to steal uh, these things. But these are, are kind of key points to, to help people appreciate uh, what learning is about. And then even though learning is a fantastic thing, there are challenges. And some of those challenges is, is something we're trying to address with uh, research. And I'll try and, and walk through some of these things uh, and send that. Uh, and by the way, Whenever you have a question, please fire it off, because otherwise we will be far away from the slides where you had the questions, so just interrupt me uh, there. I have a pause button here, and I can just switch that on and then I'll resume. Uh, and I have two warnings here. First, about the truth. The question is, will I tell the truth when I'm talking here? This is more, <laughs> I think, was more relevant when you're talking to Java people. Yes, I will tell the truth. Yeah. The whole truth? No. <laughs> you can't handle the whole truth, basically, if you're a Java person. Uh, that, and then we'll also help your OTP, yes indeed. So that we go on that one. Then morning number two, uh, I really love earning. In this, in this crowd, this is not a problem. But I was just warning people up front that, well, I do love the, the, the language and the technology, so there might be some serious love ahead. Anyway, so, and then well, we have Mike here, one of the founders as well, so he knows all these things. And uh, the realities of software development ha hasn't changed that much. Maybe it's just becoming more intense. Uh, you need to get your stuff out in a, in a hurry. <coughs> you need to make use of whatever computing resources are there, otherwise somebody else will, and they'll keep you out of the market. You need to be able to scale when you're having a success. And then maintenance. You need to take the burden of maintenance down. And that's something that faces any software company. Yeah. So, what could be? Let's just imagine here, thinking out of the box for a second. What if you can beat your competition by being three times as productive as they are? That would be nice. What if you just magically got a good scale, scale up on the number of cores and the number of machines you had available? That would also be quite nice. What if the amount of code you grew, uh, had to write, went from a huge pile down to a small pile? Well, that would also be quite nice. And all of this equals money. So, and that's a good thing, because if you're making money, uh, or saving money, you, you could probably beat your competition. And the good news is, the future's here, and the future's early. <coughs> so, well, I'm preaching to the choir here, but anyway. So, uh, um, then we'll come down to, and this is one of the things where if you're having issues making people understand what Erlang is about, and why it's, it's, it has its uses, Go back to one, we have Bjarne here actually. This is ripped from Bjarne's fantastic uh, doctor thesis. Licentiate uh, thesis. Yeah, licentiate yeah, sorry. It's, it's, <laughs> it's in Denmark we call the doctor. Uh, anyway, that is, by the way, a good thesis. Normally, when people get to that elevated state of having to, to get a thesis, it's unreadable, but this one is actually good. So you can actually read it. And I said that in Aarhus as well, Bjarne, so. <laughs> Stop. Unfortun me. Unfortunately, I don't have that on video, so 
Anyway, it was meant for being able to deal with large scale concurrency, soft real time, distributed systems, hardware interaction, very large software systems, complex functionality, continuous operations for many years, software maintenance on the fly, high quality and reliability, and fault tolerance. Now, when you look at this list, you're going to think, this sounds familiar. This sounds like the kind of requirements any odd person will come up to you if you're sitting with software development. I need to have all this covered. And the thing is, it sounds good if you could get that package somewhere, or at least something that would help you address these things. And this is the thing you have to remember when you talk about Erlang. It was designed to solve these things in a specific domain. It was telecom. But as long as you have a system where you can tick off a lot of these points, Erlang might be a good fit. I'm saying might, because I'm, I, we can't push Erlang on every problem in the world. But if you have a lot of these things in your, your problem set, this, is, this might be a good idea to pick up Erlang for it. And, uh, so, and here's, here's the thing, and this is where the, 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 the real killer part uh, about Erlang kicks in. in. In telecom, if you take a domain it was created for Erlang, it's a big blob there, then you take it generic or general, general purpose programming language, B, C++, Java. I'm, d I'm being kind there because uh, if you took C, it would be a very small blob in the middle uh, there. But anyway, the, the gap between what you get from the language in the middle and out into solving all the problems of the domain, that's code you have to write yourself. And the bigger the gap, the more code you need to write. And we all know how much it costs to make a line of code. Uh, there. So that's obviously something. Else. Then enters Erlang. It's more tailored towards telecom, meaning that the gap out here is smaller. That smaller gap is benefits. It's right in your pocket in some way. It's easier for you to develop uh, uh, programs in this domain because it has a better fit. And then it comes back to if you have a domain that looks like something like this, you might have a good chance of making benefits of using Erlang. Uh, there. And then the sweet spot for Erlang, and this is also well described by Ghana, that we don't want to deal with the GUI stuff at the top. We don't want to deal with drivers here at the bottom because that's just a drag and land. No, we want to be on the middleware, coordination and co control. So all the problem that has to do with this kind of thing, and in the telecom world, it, it, it speak, this would be the control plane of things, then you have a good fit with Erlang because that's what it's meant for. The U User plane, this is where, for instance, the telecom system said, where the audio is flowing, that's normally written in assembly or C. That's something we just put away. We control it, set it up, and then it runs, because there are other uh, timing requirements on that. So, and other places where Erlang has been used, and this, now you can start seeing, this is not telecom. These are different things, that's messaging. Messaging suggests a lot of the different uh, things there, we're having to be scalable and, and responsive, and there's a lot of control plane going on. So we have, we made our own clone from Mongoose IM of eJeopardy. Uh, there. Uh, there, that's one thing there. We have web servers, yours. If you ever want to run with a, a very robust web server, take yours. I've seen people write Python-like code in Java, uh, in Erlang. Python-like code in Erlang, and it doesn't break yours. Yours just, oh, I'll survive this nonsense, and it actually performs. So that's a really good server. And then we've been involved in having solutions in payment switches and soft switches uh, there. There's both uh, Vocalink and payment switch um, for the Singapore market. And that's actually a very tough place to get in and do it. So it was quite a feat to get Erling in and solve that problem. And then we are involved in OpenFlow Link, where we're developing a switch, uh, an OpenFlow switch in Erlang, and having the benefits of having a language that's easy to maintain and easy to update these things. Uh, because it's a when you say we, that's Erlang Solutions? That's Erlang Solutions. Yeah, I am part of the company. Even though I'm located in Denmark, I consider myself to be, uh, yeah, at least I'm on the payroll, so I'm, I'm one of the guys contributing to the red numbers, if there are any of those. Uh, <laughs> any. So, and then there's distributed databases. I think probably the most one you've heard the most about is React, but there's also CouchDB, was also written in, in Erlang and is written in Erlang. And then there's Scalise, that's a key value store, but that's not used that much. You missed off Rabbit. Rabbit, yeah, yeah that, that's a messaging system. Yeah, a messaging queue, actually. So that, that's another one. Yes, it go, list goes on. It's a massive amount of places where it's used. And then again, 
I'll put in a word from our sponsors here, uh, that if the tool fits, you must select. And this is about, again, TechMesh. If you have a problem, and you have a tool that fits to solve that problem, why not use that tool? <clears throat> and the, the problem is, for most people, they don't know that many tools. I think what's interesting with some of them, though, is you can look at the implementation of other languages as well and compare them. Yeah. And, and you can see how, how more, much more compact and how much fewer lines of code it's taken. Yeah, in exactly. In the same when, when I worked for Motorola, we had a study done on that. Mm. Uh, I initiated that. And, oh, okay. Yeah, and then yeah, we got, started, yeah. we had like, yeah, it took a third, a third of the code to get the same functionality. There's lots of things out there. Yeah. I mean, Revit MQ, there's, there's <laughs> versions of AMQ yeah. written in C++, yeah. so you can compare it directly. Yeah, yeah and you can just see the pain. Yeah. Right, it, it's really amazing how much pain people the go through. The test I give to the Java people, the C++ teams, is, is show me a ping pong program. Yeah. And it'll be the, pages and pages yeah, and yeah. multiple and there's and Three lines in there, that. Yeah, yeah, it's done. Yeah, yeah. Exactly. <laughs> but anyway, the thing is, learn about more tools. There's more tools than Erlang in the world. So TechMesh is a good place to be and learn about these alternative ways of solving problems. And again, Erlang is not the right tool for everything. So the more tools you use uh, or know about, the better informed you are in, in taking decisions about technology for the next project. I think that's the overarching message and the, the coolness about tech message is about, it's not about one particular religion, <coughs> it's about solving problems in the smart way. Mm. Uh, there. Yeah. Then we come on to the more technical bits uh, there, and these are the bits where you can go and if you want to talk to people about what's, why is Erlang a good idea and what does it do different. This is about sharing stuff. If you have a normal system, you'd have memory and you'd have processes. Now, and I've seen this because I've seen the C code that was done in the controller, they had massive fun with this one. Whenever a process, two processes accesses memory, one of them, if one of them dies, yes, burn. <laughs> it corrupts the memory. And the only sane thing, especially if you're doing a, a mission critical system, would be, yeah, well, you need to kill everything. So that's a core dump of everything and you restart the machine so you get boom. All service is gone. Yeah. And that means that the machine is rebooting and the operator of the big system you sold is then calling your vice president in the middle of the night screaming and yelling at him, he gets on the plane to Europe and yeah, you know, yeah, the story is not that pretty. Now, the way Erlang does this is you have memory, but it allocates memory for each process. So there's no shared memory. The only way these processes can communicate is by sending messages to one another. No shared memory. So when the P1 goes off and dies, boom. Prop memory, yeah, so what? It'll be garbage collected at some point, and the P2 over here on the right can just continue its merry life. And that's, yeah, and then that's garbage collection happening there on the, on the uh, press of a button. Exactly. So, then there's dealing with these failures, because one thing is, you could say, wait, wait a minute, you're just crashing. How can that be of any use? Yeah, well, you need to be able to then deal with those crashes in a sensible way. And the way you do it with processes in Erlang is either you link them together so that if one dies, the other process dies. Or you set up a monitoring scheme and say if one process dies, the other one will be notified about that. And then you use that to say, oh wait, this process is dying, what do I want to do about it? Normally you would set up some sort of monitoring on that process. Oh, if it dies, I know what to do and I'll repair the system. And that's the way you deal with these things instead of just... you. Could provide infinite amount of processes running and if you did nothing when they crashed, there would be a little doubt, at least in my mind, that you're providing a system that has value. You need to be able to deal with these uh, errors in, a, in the same manner. And the way it's been done on top of the basic Erlang principles is with in the OTP library, you have uh, supervision trees where you have a supervisor at the top and it can have supervisors below it. And the edges here, or the leaves of this tree, is worker processes. So if something dies down here, it's up to the supervisor, just a bit above it. And we can't see deadly with this one anyway. So, but it's up to the supervisor just uh, above it to take care of that uh, failure. And then this, in this way, you can sort of distribute how to handle the failures. And it also, the, the nice thing about this is, your code is not cluttered with all sorts of defensive madness to avoid errors. You crash, and somewhere else in the system, there's code that takes care of that crash 
in the same manner. It's kind of similar to what they try to do with aspect-oriented programming, only this actually works. So, anyway. Then there's something where you can distribute over cores. This is one of the things that I don't think it was intentionally like that in the beginning with Erlang. I think it's something that... Not over cores, but over machines. Over machines, yeah. But over cores, the model actually works as well. Because then you'd have, you have cores here, two cores. Then there's a scheduler on each of the cores. And then there's a number of processes running on each of these uh, uh, cores under the rules. And then over machines, then you do, the thing is, you up, move it up a level, and then you have nodes. Node is then, in fact, just a Java version, uh, no, not a Java, yeah. Erlang virtual machine. Yeah, look at that. For years, virtual machines, the only thing that could be there was Java things. No, so that's an Erlang virtual machine. So every time you spawn off, start one of these off, you get a node, and whenever you connect them together using distributed Erlang, then they connect up, and in fact, these are TCP connections uh, there, and they do it fully meshed, so fully connected. So you end up with something that, that looks like this, and you can imagine how it looks when it grows even further. So, and there are some challenges in that, that, that you need to have a lot of connections. And then, hey, this is about uh, avoiding to die. And this is something about whenever you have a large system, over time, the customers will have that insane idea that they need to enhance the system in some way, add new features. <coughs> and when it, when it came back to the good old days of the 70s, you'd started off with uh, Glamrock, and you'd learn all the moves for that. Then came a major disruption, a version upgrade, and went into Disco. You were out of business. All your moves were gone. You had to restart totally. You were out of service for yeah, however long it took you to get back into business. And after Disco, it turned into yeah, pop, and uh, you had to learn new moves again. So you were out of business while you were learning new moves. But the way you do this in Erlang, Erlang style, staying alive, is that you have a process that's running one version of your code. <coughs> then you load a new version of the code into the VM, it's ready, and then you send a code chain signal to that process, and it will boom, start running the next version. And that's quite useful, because then you're not taking your system down, you're just moving your running processes up to the next version. And that's how you do a version upgrade. And that's, I think, the, the, the cool name for it is hot code upgrade, I think. Uh, it's used a lot. But that's actually a very neat feature. And I can remember the first time I did this by hand, because if you do it with the OTP library, it's, it's sort of taken care of. But when you do it by hand the first time, and you write the code yourself, and you have a running process and it's just upgraded to a new version, you feel like, whoa, was it, was it that easy? Yeah, well, it's still not super easy, but it's easier than any other thing I could think of uh, there. So that's really something. If you haven't tried it yourself, go home and try and write a little process and upgrade it to the next version. It's amazing, really amazing. Then, despite all of this goodness, there's still challenges in, in terms of making use of Erlang. And I'll go through with some of these. One of the things is, when it really scales, when it really scale, when Erlang really scale, when you've written a program and you throw an, a machine with many more cores in it, or you, you add more machines to the thing, will it actually scale? Well, it's hard to say, but fortunately in the release EU project, there's an EU project where there's a lot of uh, companies and universities involved. Uh, one of the, apart from Erlang Solutions, there's also Ericsson. Involved, so the OTP team is in on this one as well. Uh, there, but this one, Benchel, is actually coming out of. Uh, I can't remember if it's Gothenburg or it's the Greek university. No one. They made a, a tool where you can put in your, uh, your your application, and then it will run through a test suite and see what happens and measure the performance as you add more cores or you add more machines. So there, you're getting an answer. And then it'll help you uh, then as a way of saying, oh, wait a minute, it doesn't really scale. Then you can start looking for the bottlenecks. Because one thing is that Erlang has the ability to distribute over cores and machines. You still have to think about it. There are still bottlenecks in these things. So you still have to think about it in order to get as much scalability out of it as, as possible. Yeah, so that's one thing. That's one tool that helps uh, out of that. Then if you have many cores running, uh, well, also many machines, you would actually have it might have some questions when you're looking at the system. When is a certain process running? 
compared to where, when the other processes are, uh, are running, because there can only be one process active at the same time uh, on a core. Um, and then you might look at another process, who actually started this guy? Because one of the things is you can open up and you can see all the live processes, but you might want to ask these questions. And this is where the uh, Percept tool, Percept is a inspection tool uh, made by Ericsson, and uh, this again release is, is uh, improving the functionality here, and here in this case, you can see when the different, the green bar here, is when a given function here is actually running. So you can use it to inspect your system and see what goes on as you, you're trying out different things with it. And that might be a very good way to spot a bottleneck in your system and say, wait a minute, this process is doing nothing for that period of time. Oh, it's because, so this is a way of, of learning about that, uh, in a way. Then, memory allocation. Yeah. Previously, um, there was, what was the key point here? Yeah. When you had, this is multi, this is a multi core, just to keep my tongue straight. You have multi core here, you have a number of schedulers running on the same uh, machine but on different cores. You had one message allocator. That's what's uh, in release 12, that's some years ago. But anyway, you had one message allocator uh, running, so you had a bottleneck in that. And then in release 15, this is this is the ongoing version, uh, right? I think release 16 is just around up. You end up having a message, uh, a memory allocator per scheduler, so you don't have a bottleneck. So things are running more, the separate life on each core, meaning you get more out of having more cores instead of have a central point of a, a bottleneck in, in the uh, the memory allocator. So that's a good, and then again release project is bringing that. Then <coughs> upgrading blocks. Yeah. So. As I showed you before, the code you're running is called the current code, and then you have the next code, and this is when you do the upgrades from one version to another. <coughs> and what happens in the uh, Erlang system today, whenever you load code, i.e. you put in some code here that's the next thing you want to run with your processes, all schedules are blocked, which is kind of a pain because you, you're just taking all the uh, productivity out of the system, nothing happens while you're loading code uh, on neither of the machine uh, cores involved. Even if it's, you're only loading code on one scheduler and you don't have it done for the next scheduler yet, it still blocks them all while it's doing that. Then what's going to happen in uh, R16 is that you'll have another code block down here, last code, and that the ability there you get for that is that when you're loading code, then you won't have a uh, scheduler's blocking. Each scheduler will do the code loading when it's needed by that scheduler. Meaning if you're doing code loading on one scheduler, yeah, that's blocked, but the other ones are running and they're still providing services in your system. Uh, there. So you don't, don't get these blobs of time where, where nothing is happening. Yeah, and that is my notes. Yes, it's R16. So it's just around the corner that you get this functionality. Then, as I said before, when you make system and the distributed uh, earning system and you connect them all up, you end up having this tremendously nice looking graph showing that every node is connected to every other node. And the thing is, it's not that much of a burden, it, it works for many, many machines. The problem is you get a lot of messages, for instance, if, if this guy up here dies, you'll tell everybody that he died. And that doesn't necessarily mean that everybody should be notified about that. It might be that he's running something that's totally unrelated to what's going on on the other nodes. So the way it's been looked at, and that's also in release, is they're trying to do these S groups, um, where you group the nodes together. So inside an S group, the nodes are still fully connected, but between the different S, S groups, you can choose and mix how many you want to connect together. Meaning that the amount, whenever a node goes down, you have control over saying, wait a minute, I don't need to tell everybody that I'm down. And then you can have a... The, the way we used to solve that in a lot of the compute grids was to multicast that data out. Yeah. But uh, then the systems could decide whether or not they wanted to subscribe to that information or not. They made the sender and they had to send it once. That is one way of doing it. And this is, is the attempt of trying to take the a configuration option into Erlang and saying this is how it, and the, the way it's been developed is that it's something you can try out as a library it's not being forced into the language so it's going to be tried out as a library 
and see if this way of organizing your distributed learning system makes sense. And if it does, then of course there'll probably be somebody pushing for it to be be a part of learning itself. But that would the other way with multicasting would be another well, way. So doing we did when we had thousands of computers and yeah. we had to uh, be end squared problem you yeah. a million connections. Yeah. There, it's, it yeah. Doesn't work. Because a lot of the stuff will be noise. You yeah. have normally you have a system where there's clearly designated. But the systems are so busy just listening to noise. Yeah. It's, especially when you start having failures on net splits yeah. and things like that, then everything comes to a grinding halt. In, in that case, uh, there. But this is this is, this is not done yet. This has been uh, fought out in release so far, and right now they're working. Uh, <coughs> let's see. I think it's up in Edinburgh. They're working on that. Now they're working on on figuring out how to do this and how to get it implemented. The design is there. The thinking has been done, and now we need to see how it works out with the library <coughs> and how it's going to affect people coding. Then, if you have a sufficiently big system. <coughs> You come into the issue of managing them. So you need to provision machines. Again, this is not no different from any other programming language, actually. You need to provision the machines. You need to deploy the Erlang application on it. You need to attach to the node that's running the Erlang application. And then you need to dig out some metrics, because you need to know what's going on in your system. <coughs> and the thing you'd normally dig out would be things like memory usage, CPU load, and the process hierarchy of what's going on. And this is, well, it's doable. And not many good tools are around at the moment for this, so this is why we here at uh, Erlang Solutions we're doing a tool called Sicily. It means, yeah, wait for it. <laughs> the official name is <coughs> Cloud Computing Lace. So you've got this nice lace that can sort of tie your things together. And when we're being more sarcastic about it, it's Cloud Cuckoo Land <laughs> from the Greek tragedy where it's this town in the sky where everything is just rosy and good. So that's because this is meant for doing things for deployment in, uh, in cloud computing. And anyway, I threw it in just you see the architecture. The idea is that you have a, either a web UI or a command line interface, you fire off things you want to get done. At, at the end of the day, you'll have your system running over here. It's actually running on these nodes. And then you will have a operation and maintenance node that looks after these nodes and looks after what's happening. And then it reports metrics out this way. It might be with RabbitMQ. Uh, we haven't decided on that then. And then you collect it up over here in a metrics manager and you can see what's going on in your system. So it tries to automate all these things you would like to see about a system as it uh, evolves. And one of the things where it's, it's kind of nice here is here. Just, uh, but here we're trying to we, we made an EC2 adapter uh, for Amazon, so we can deploy on Amazon, and then we're trying we're going, going to do one more, uh, at least to know that the, the framework we're doing works, because then you can deploy on basically any cloud provider or any physical machine you might have around. But we're doing them just enough to know that it works, and then when there are people coming <coughs> around and say, wait a minute, I want it for VMware, okay, then we'll do VMware and, and get it on there. So, uh, yeah, that's work in progress, um, and we're actually kind of looking forward to this one because this will be a nice way of running systems. Yeah? Uh, how does it differ from what Amazon offers with uh, Amazon the single workflow? Good question. The thing is, this is tailored or focused specifically at Erlang systems. Because one of the key points here is that you, your system are the ones running over here. In fact, the importance of things are not according to the size. But you would like to know about your Erlang applications running here, your Erlang system. And there you need something tailored to do that. And, and we are constantly, in fact, we are constantly looking to see how much of Amazon can we reuse so we don't have to write everything from scratch. Because a lot of the stuff you're doing here in terms of setting up machines and uh, deployment uh, and provisioning, that's something you should just get as much help as you can uh, from whatever cloud vendor you're trying to interact with. Right. Yeah. Because you can you, you do something similar with cloud formation in terms of setting up machines, and then uh, you can do metrics gathering with CloudWatch, and it lets you yeah. publish your metrics and build them with the, is the UI and everything else as well. Yeah. And the thing is, we want to get in and be very Erlang specific about this and get extra things. So one of the things we have 
it's not quite obvious from this drawing, is that we would like people that when they write their applications, that they write a little adapter so they can get metrics about their system, not just the CPU and the uh, memory usage, but also specific metrics about how their system is doing, their Erlang system is doing. Okay. And get that close up. the loop so I can provision more nodes yeah. if, I, if, if I need those. Yeah. And, and the, one of the things, and the, this is not in the, the, the first version we're going to do, is that we would like to have this one, when it measures things on what's going on in the system, that it feeds back and you say, wait a minute, now it's time to scale. So it can, you can set up rules and now I'll yeah. provision another machine, I'll get this one, and it then attaches one and then you end up having four machines running over here doing your system. So but that's the down the road. The for you. Yeah. <clears throat> but the thing is, that's not trivial. So the no, first thing right. we're doing, we, we want to do the deployment here, and then we want to see what happens when you have the metrics in place. Because once you have the data coming in, you, have, you are in a position where you can take decisions about what you want to do. So it's, it's ongoing work, but that's definitely in our vision to, uh, to, to see if we can do auto-scaling up and down. Yeah. So uh, one, one, one at the back first. One back. Because you, I'm assuming, because um, I'm quite new to Elaine, but yeah. from what I've read so far, the, you can have multiple nodes. Am I, am I right in thinking you have multiple nodes per compute unit on AWS? Yeah. So a single compute unit, you could have, say, five. Yeah. It might be a sensible policy, but you could have. You could have. You need some kind of way to jump to provision the next chunk. Yeah. So you need some kind of... Uh, yeah. Yeah. Okay. yeah. And all of that is something that, as I see it, it's very difficult to come up with a generic solution up front. Mm -hmm. I think the, the important part of a framework like this is you provide the ability to do things and then the, the people that are doing it come up with their own rules it, of, no, yeah, really because then they know what, uh, what is important here. Uh, in order, when do you need another machine? How would you, you decide that? I don't think I can come up with an answer for people up front. Oh, you're going to need seven machines when you hit that one. No. No, no clue. So we have two more questions. Yeah, that's good. So, so I've worked on systems which do that. And yeah. You really have to watch out that there's limits set in there. So they can run away. Yeah. And before you know it, you've got thousands of systems provisioned. Uh, yeah. IBM did a lot of good work in this whole area. They call it autonomics of, of yeah. some good al yeah. algorithms and things yeah. and, and, and processes to actually um, monitor there. So yeah. a whole mathematical approach to yeah. actually. Uh, trying to solve that problem. It is actually difficult. It is. It's easy to get it working in the lab. Yeah, yeah. To, uh, but to want to have something that's under control when you get out in the wild. Particularly when it's costing you real money. Yeah, and with Amazon it's costing you real, real money. Because yeah. they add a zero to every uh, yeah. bill uh, yeah. uh, there. So. Yeah, I was going to say that well, we, we, so long you can put your, uh, push your metrics to Amazon Cloud, which uh, you fully have the ability to set our alarms on your metrics. And have those alarm trigger scaling actions either on auto scaler level so that you can bring up uh, based on your policy, say 10% uh, extra capacity, yeah, yeah. and have it be, be initialized using cloud formation, mm. using your template, so that you can already get you know, new machines that are, mm. that's got your code running, that are ready to, uh, to do stuff, yeah. and continue to push metrics to CloudWatch and feed the loop of uh, making decisions on when to scale up and when yeah. to scale down, and what to do with those yeah. uh, scaling tr uh, uh, triggers as well. Yeah. So, so there are definitely things we're looking at. Uh, remember, one of the things also here, we started out with EC2 because we, had, we were familiar with that. But the idea is to have something here where people can basically write their own adapter and then use it on whatever cloud provider. I don't want to force people to use Amazon. There might be people out there not willing to use might it. Want to use rack space. Might want to use yeah, Rackspace. Might want to use Rackspace, or might not want to do it. Might <coughs> want to run it on their own machines. Might do. Yeah. yeah. So, so the, the thing is here to provide people with the opportunity to, to choose what they want to do and get some of these things out uh, there. And I, I think to be realistic, the time where we get to the hours of scaling is the time where we have people actually using it for big systems. The minute we get that, then the requirements for that be, will become obvious. I think it would be presumptuous to think you can figure that out, out now and say this is how it's going to be. I think this will be based on real users <coughs> using it and saying this is the kind of functionality we need to use and these are the kind of algorithms we need to pick up in order to do it in the, in the right way. So, but that's something we, we're looking at. Uh, and uh, yeah, again, by the way, the guy that invented this name is from Sicily. <laughs> so, now we come to something that's a bit of a dark horse in the history of, of Erlang, that's parallelism. Because Erlang was created for 
as I said earlier, explicit concurrency, fault tolerance and a highly concurrent system. It was not intended for, or at least it has no direct support for, matrix multiplication, ray tracing and coarse grain parallel problems. That was just not on the plate when it was created. And I think when you look at technology history, taking the choices that was done with Erlang <coughs> was brilliant because it solves a particular set of problems very well and then forget about the rest. I think that's the most mature way of doing things and uh, you find it in very few other places. That's why I love Erlang. It, it's, it's very dedicated to this, this solve this one problem right there. But still, then you get to these modern days, you want to do these funny stuff uh, things uh, there. So we have, uh, in paraphrase, that's another EU project, uh, we're looking at something where we would like to do intentional parallelism. Yeah. So, does any of you know Lucid? No. It's a demand-driven data computation language. I had no clue what that was until three months ago. We have one of our engineers working on this project, and um, yeah, he's grown a full beard now, so he's getting really hairy. He was hairy before he had the beard, though. Anyway, but the, 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 the thing we're trying to drive here is to find the shortcomings in the Erlang VM and the scheduler there, and see if what could we fix something there, or we do have to do something on the side. And in the, at the moment, we're trying to get this way of computing and understanding of how it works done on the side, and then we're writing a scheduler for that, and then we'll start to see how can we get things to, to match up uh, at the very end. And variables in this thing here, and this is where my head starts hurting slightly, just slightly, is the variables are infinite streams of values. And any of you have done, have tried, has any of you tried doing lazy programming in Haskell? As yeah, so you get these infinite things and yeah, it feels kind of weird. It's, mathematically it's fine, but your head is like, hmm. So, Here's actually an example of how this kind of program would be, that you, you, you compute the running average of your input is that you take the first element of the input, followed by the sum of the next of the input, and the next of the input then is the rest of this infinite stream of numbers, and then you have a n, which is 1, followed by one n plus 1, so that's 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, an infinite stream of numbers, and then the running average is magically the sum divided by n. And that generates another infinite stream of numbers and it just comes out. I find this to be black magic. But we have a guy on it and he's very happy with this kind of thing and uh, yeah, I'm trying to be as supportive as I can as his manager, but I don't get it. <laughs> Simply don't get it, uh, all the details of it. But it's quite fun uh, there. And this will allow us to, to, to dig in and unleash all these other things with parallel computations so our, our vision at the moment is that as we had early on that you had the control plane with Erlang, that's the still, we still want to do that. And then at the bottom, instead of having drivers for hardware and things like that, we want to have these parallel things going on. So Erlang controls all of these hardcore computations and then it's spawned off and done at the bottom uh, in, in a driver or in, in some other way. So that's the idea to, to follow that model and see if, if we can bring intentional uh, explicit concurrency together with this intentional parallelism. And this is very much early days on this one, but uh, it's funny. And it's funny to, to, to be part of, of doing that. Uh, anyway, going forward, um, I think the key point here is that you should consider Erlang <coughs> when the problem fits. Um, I can say this now, I think, because Francesco is not in the room. If you're forced to do stuff on the Java virtual machine, Debian, you, you can't do it, your customer says you have to do it, think about using something like Scala and Akka. Because they provide similar things to what Erlang has. In fact, Akka is a total ripoff of OTP in Erlang. So if you have something there, use the thing that actually works. Because if your customer is forcing you to do something, well, solve it with the right tool, not necessarily Erlang, but the right tool there with the right mechanisms for it. Uh, there, I think that's uh, there. But all, in other, all other cases, mm -hmm. pick Erlang. It's the best one, mm -hmm. I would say, in the, when, it, when it comes to those kind of. Uh, and then try to have more focus on the right tool for the job. But given that you are here already, I think you already have that one. But again, Tech Mesh would be the the place to go and uh, learn more about this. And, uh
I think he, it would be a good thing to go there and, and, and learn more tools for it. And I think that concludes my talk. Questions? No, no questions. I then we, it's should, we should first do a little applause and then thank you. Okay. <laughs>
the yeah. big cloud system. They haven't tested it on more machines. Yeah. No. So, but of course, it won't yeah. just continue up into the final. Of course, you know, Intel and the vendors have given up and given us faster processes, so we just get more calls. Yeah. Uh, I've already got systems in my lab with over a thousand calls per server now. Yeah. And that's that's going to be, you know, that, yeah, there the trend are, is going to increase. It's, and I think the, the, the limit with cores at the moment uh, in Erlang is around 30. Mm. That you get a whatever you do, you have run into issues around 30 cores uh, on the machine, and that needs tweaking as well. Is that and that's an Erlang limit? It's not an OS constraint. I, mean, I think it's an Erlang, Erlang limit. The yeah, OS will support. Yeah, I mean, and cores. Yeah, 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 yeah. I, I think it's an Erlang limit uh, <coughs> in terms of the scheduler. Or what goes yeah. on there? Because yeah. the, the, this is why, uh, as you saw, that they're trying to move out so things becomes more become more distributed on the cores, like the memory mm -hmm. allocator. Yeah. That, that one goes to each uh, scheduler, so it runs on each core instead of having a central point. And there are other places where you need to fix things in order to to unleash everything. Mm -hmm. But it's ongoing work, and they're working on it all the time. One of the things to keep in mind, though, is the majority of machines that Erlang is used for these days don't have that many cores. No, so, but so, so, bear in mind, you can't actually buy processors from Intel now with less than 16 yeah. or whatever cores per yeah. circuit now. And, and that, that, that yeah. doubles every, every Moore's law of bump. Yeah, so, and, and, and they're aware of it in the OTP team. Mm -hmm. But they keep the limit and the, the amount of improvements they put it into it. They, they try to fit it with the market, what's out there of, yeah. uh, of um, common uh, machines to run it on. So that's why you don't, they yeah. don't invest a lot of time right now in doing a thousand core mm -hmm. thing uh, there. So they're trying to, to make sure that they use their money wisely. Yeah. Because there are other features that need to be attended to. People like Intel who make that may be interested in sponsoring some of that activity because they, yeah. uh, they, are, they are trying to uh, yeah, improve have. everything running on those machines. Intel guys, <coughs> Intel guys, they are all about wanting to do the parallel stuff. Yeah, yeah. but... Uh, uh, there's a range of parallel stuff. So, yeah. so yes, they want to do a lot of the grid stuff, yeah. but that's a very limited uh, use yeah. case. Yeah. yeah, true, that's true. But most of the, the stuff they have people working on are yeah. more in the parallel world yeah. than it yeah. is yeah. in the yeah. concurrent no, no, no. world. Yeah, no, I understand that. Yeah. But then again, people dealing with concurrency is a very limited crowd, mm. which is sad because a lot of pr yeah. problem actually needs explicit concurrency to be solved. Mm. Even when you get thousand core machines, you mm. still have coordination it problems. Gets, uh, it gets worse. So, yeah, <laughs> exponentially worse. You know, you have a problem here that's very difficult to work out. That uh, you can chase the problem. Sometimes the problem's in the OS, and sometimes the problem's in the Erlang infrastructure, and very frequently the problem's in the machines itself. Mm. But as you get more current currency, this sort of system we're talking about, you know, the problem very often lands up in cash. Because yeah. if you have lots of processes doing memory access, yeah. You can get sort of cash in consistency very, very easily. Yeah, but um, yeah. And a, it, it's a non trivial program to optimize these things. Oh, yeah. And it's even more non trivial to work out if you have a system where is the problem? Mm -hmm. it's, a, it's, a, it's not easy. <laughs> but I'm hopeful that it, it will be easier to solve it with Erlang than with some of the other languages. <laughs> 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 so certainly. <laughs> If you write something in C with a lot of P-threads communicating with sort of a... Yeah, it's, it's a nightmare. It's yeah. a nightmare. I've got them. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. yeah, that's a massive nightmare. That's just P. Yeah. And even if it works today, you don't know if it's going to work tomorrow. No, no. Because the lots can be different. Yeah, it could be a butterfly <laughs> waving its wings in Tokyo and then you're yeah. doomed on it. So, yeah. More questions? And remember, we have beers afterwards, so questions doesn't stop. They will keep flowing, but yeah. Will the slides be available for people like me who arrived very, very late? Yes. Thank you. <laughs> Even for those that arrived there very early. <laughs> I don't know how we make them available. I'll talk to uh, Andra or something. Yeah. We'll make sure that they're available. And please remember multicore, which is the code word for uh, getting uh, a ticket to a land factory, right? Yeah. That's your discount code. And you should just say, hallelujah, long live Erlang, and then you have a beer outside. <laughs> <laughs> that should take it to get done. Thank you. Thank you for coming. And then we'll last one.